So I'm uh, Jeff Healy from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and I'm a cardiologist, clinical trialist who works at the Population Health Research Institute. And the trial I presented today was called the ATLAS trial, uh, which is a randomized trial comparing subcutaneous versus transvenous devices. Yeah, so the background here is that ICD therapy is, is the cornerstone of therapy for prevention of uh, sudden death in patients at risk for ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, therapy has been around for many years, works extremely well. However, uh, we have an issue uh, with lead-related complications, and they represent the majority of complications we see. Uh, somewhere between 3 and 4% of individuals may have these. And uh, the SICD, or the totally subcutaneous ICD, was designed uh, to be able to treat ventricular arrhythmias without having to place any hardware into the chest, into the heart itself, and uh, hopefully mitigate those uh, types of complications. Now, it should seem obvious perhaps that this would prevent complications. However, uh, we felt that one needed a clinical trial to prove uh, not only that this did indeed work, but to quantify the magnitude and also you know, see what the counterbalancing issues might be in terms of how well did the new type of defibrillator work? Did you give up anything in terms of uh, shock effectiveness or uh, rates of inappropriate shock? Right, so this was a randomized controlled trial. So we took patients uh, who were eligible, so primarily younger patients and those that had increased risk uh, for lead-related complications. Uh, they were screened, uh, both clinically and then uh, electrocardiographically screened to make sure that they were suitable uh, for the SICD. And 92% of individuals were suitable for both types of devices. They were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion between the two groups. Uh, everybody had a baseline echo, everybody had standardized defibrillator programming, and then we followed forward and measured our primary safety outcome, that uh, cluster of lead-related complications. We measured that at six months after implant in all patients. So the key findings were indeed uh, the subcutaneous defibrillator worked as we had hoped. Uh, there was a, a substantial and statistically significant reduction in lead-related complications of 92 percent. Uh, and these complications occurred in 4.8% of those uh, in the transvenous device arm and were reduced by 92% uh, with the subcutaneous device. So common complications and significantly reduced. The second, uh, you know, the second cluster of findings were around the ICD performance. So it was fairly clear the device worked well. It was highly effective uh, when tested in the operating room. So defibrillation testing was highly successful. And over time, although we had relatively fewer uh, events during the course of the trial. Uh, the effectiveness of the subcutaneous ICD was similar uh, to that of the transvenous device in terms of its effectiveness for terminating uh, clinical ventricular arrhythmias. Now, uh, follow-up of these patients is now ongoing for another two to three years uh, to gather more data on this topic, but it seemed to be equally effective. Now, there was a, uh, an interesting story around inappropriate shocks. Uh, statistically speaking, there was no significant difference between the two types of defibrillator, although numerically uh, there were more in the subcutaneous arm of the trial. Um, this was close to being significant, so worthy of discussion. Um, and I think there are three key points to mention. First, both arms had very low rates of inappropriate shock. So 1.2% uh, per year in the transvenous arm, 2.7% per year in the subcutaneous arm. Both of those numbers are lower than you know, where we were with transvenous devices in large clinical trials 10 years ago, like the Matt rit trial, where uh, the rate was 2.9% uh, per year. So that is uh, very much lower. So uh, both of these devices performed well. Secondly, whenever uh, a device uh, gives an inappropriate shock, uh, the types uh, are different between the two arms. So both are at risk of giving shocks due to noise, and uh, there was a little bit of bad luck in the trial in that one in four inappropriate shocks uh, was due to electromagnetic interference from patients using uh, consumer-facing uh, transcutaneous nerve stimulators, or TENS units, and that's something that, they, uh, that shouldn't happen uh, because the devices are are not supposed to be used by defibrillator patients, but uh, that, that did inflate. So even, you know, the rate was even lower if you take that mechanism of failure out. If in the transvenous arm, inappropriate shocks tended to be for atrial arrhythmias, like atrial fibrillation. In the uh, subcutaneous arm, they tended to be due to T-wave oversensing. And in some ways, uh, the ATLAS trial was a very rigorous test of the new subcutaneous defibrillator because 
These patients were young. They were in their late 40s on average. They had a lot of uh, inherited arrhythmia disorders rather than older individuals with coronary disease. So these individuals uh, were, were actually less likely to have atrial fibrillation. And so in, in some ways, uh, you know, they, uh, the SICD was less likely uh, to eliminate those type of arrhythmia-induced uh, inappropriate shocks because this, this population simply is not at high risk of having atrial fibrillation. So lots of further dissection to be done from our trial group, uh, lots of continued follow-up, and of course, you know, some opportunity to analyze together our results in the earlier Praetorian trial to really understand how we best select patients to mitigate risk of inappropriate shocks. But at the end of the day, the rates are small, you know, between one and 2.7 percent per year. And, you know, when you balance, you, you know, clinicians have to balance that off against, you know, a, uh, an absolute reduction of about 4 percent in the rate of uh, lead-related complications. So it, it becomes a, a very interesting consideration and ultimately a decision for uh, physicians and their patients to make together. So when we designed the trial, we had tilted the inclusion criteria primarily to a younger population where more patients with inherited arrhythmia disorders simply because uh, earlier work in the pediatric and young adult literature had suggested that these individuals are much higher rate for chronic lead failure and some reports up to three to four percent per year uh, because of the longer dwell time for the lead over many years and in fact decades. Uh, the, the more muscular, robust, and active nature of younger individuals compared to older individuals, healthier individuals compared to less healthy individuals. So that's who we targeted in this study, and I think uh, the study results are reassuring for the use of the subcutaneous device in that specific population. As I mentioned and you alluded to, uh, this population may be slightly more prone to T-wave oversensing uh, than an older population, and they don't derive the same benefit in avoiding inappropriate shocks due to atrial fibrillation simply because they don't have that arrhythmia as frequently. Um, but uh, again, they're, they're a population where there's uh, intuitive desire to potentially keep hardware out of the heart, out of the uh, vasculature, uh, because these patients will have uh, defibrillators hopefully for decades. So I think, I think ATLAS adds to the totality of the clinical evidence here uh, for the subcutaneous defibrillator, which has been you know, in clinical use for approximately one decade. Um, I think the clear addition is it clearly shows superiority on its primary outcome, that it reduces major uh, lead-related complications. Uh, however, when you take it with the uh, results of Praetorian, the only other randomized clinical trial in this space, as well as uh, some of the larger registries, like the Untouched Registry, uh, which has uh, previously been published, uh, I think it, it gives a certain measure of reassurance, right? This is a new technology. It's up against a, a standard, which is a very golden standard. Transvenous devices work well. We have decades of experience with them. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a high bar for any new technology. But I think this reassures us that, yes, they deliver what they promise. They significantly and substantially reduce lead-related complications. That's now been proven, I think. Are they performing as well? I think, you know, the balance of evidence with all of these data, I think on shock efficacy, provided they're implanted correctly with uh, nice implant uh, locations, I think this looks like it's pretty reassuring that they're as effective as a transvenous device for terminating arrhythmias. Inappropriate shocks is probably the last issue to discuss, and it's a more complex issue. We need more data, more understanding of existing data. Uh, there probably is a, a, a price to pay in terms of inappropriate shocks, particularly if you're younger and you uh, have lower rates of atrial fibrillation, for example. However, you know, that may be the very population where the other consideration, which is long-term lead survivability, is the most relevant. And again, that boils down to a risk-benefit consideration uh, between physicians and doctors. So I think, you know, these data reassure, and they reassure me as an implanting physician, that uh, the subcutaneous ICD is, is really an acceptable alternative uh, to the transvenous device in patients where you really want to minimize the risk of lead-related complications and long-term failure. So the next steps, I think, in the research program are as follows. So the ATLAS patients will be followed forward for another three years. We need to gather more data on shock efficacy, more data on inappropriate shocks, and address some of the issues and continue uh, to follow those Kaplan-Meier curves to look at all-cause reoperation for the device. So is that going to save lead fractures? Are there going to be issues with battery replacement or you know, other things that cause that to, to change? But we are going to follow forward uh, for uh, all-cause reoperation. Second, 
uh, there may very well be uh, some form of pool analysis with the Praetorian trial uh, to be able to tease out subgroups, so which groups are more likely to benefit in terms of risk uh, of complication prevention, what groups are perhaps more susceptible to inappropriate shocks with one device or the other. And, uh, you know, with the two trials together, we're now dealing with a data set in a thousand plus patient range, so this is uh, giving some statistical power. There will be more registries, right? These were early trials. The average center, not physician, but the average center in Atlas had implanted 17 devices before the start of the trial. So it speaks to the relatively rapid learning curve for this, but you know, of course, you know, 17 gets you a certain level of experience, probably a large part of the experience, but you know, individuals can continue to get better, patient selection will continue to improve, and there may very well be additional evolution in the technology. So I think, you know, registries and clinical trials, we often argue over which is better. The reality is they're both excellent and they both serve specific roles in helping us to understand. So the last part of it, of course, is the subcutaneous defibrillator is put in uh, with defibrillation testing conducted. So this is a procedure uh, that we no longer do in patients with transvenous ICDs for many years now. Uh, it's currently the standard, I think, uh, with additional experience with things like the Praetorian score to assess the likelihood that the device is going to work well. These have been major innovations and of course the Praetorian group has a randomized trial where recipients either receive or do not receive defibrillation testing and I think that will be a next major step if it's shown that the, the device can be implanted with the similar effectiveness uh, without doing that step. Now that you know takes away uh, some cases completely the need for general anesthesia it certainly reduces uh, the cost and somewhat the risk of the procedure and I think that uh, that will be the next uh, major innovation and of course uh, like with many of these devices uh, in the near future or the midterm uh, there will likely be some form of innovation knowing the history of how these uh, devices evolved very very rapidly.